Welcome to another AP Chemistry General Chemistry lesson. I'm Jeremy Krug, and in this series of videos, we're learning about thermodynamics, but this time the second law of thermodynamics, lesson 16 in this series. Now, if you have been joining me on the other videos here over the last several weeks, you've been noticing that we've learned about the first law, which was mainly about enthalpy. Well, in this video, we're going to be learning about entropy, a different driving force of reactions, and thermodynamically favored processes. Now, the last couple of lessons in this series focused on heat. When we say heat, we're talking about things like enthalpy. That's another way that we sometimes refer to heat in chemical reactions, or at least as far as uh, uh, the heat that uh, can be released or absorbed in a reaction. And thermal energy, that's another way of describing that as well. Those are different, you know, sometimes interchangeable terms for heat. Now, if we take a look at the reactions that we're most familiar with, we find that most reactions are actually exothermic. That means that they release heat from the system into their surroundings. And so that means we're starting with the reactants at a higher enthalpy, a higher heat state, and they will go down to a lower enthalpy, to a lower uh, heat state. And that is, that is normal, that is natural. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, delta H, and hopefully by this point in this course you are, we've learned several ways to calculate it, delta H less than zero means that it's exothermic. And most reactions are exothermic. Uh, in fact, if you think of the reactions that you've carried out in the laboratory, most likely if you're taking chemistry, and you've carried out these reactions, you've found that most of the reactions that you're familiar with, if you put your hand next to it, it, it feels hot, doesn't it? It gives off heat. In fact, the endothermic processes that we're familiar with, the ones that feel cold to the touch, well, they're not really unusual, but, but they're not nearly as common as the exothermic processes. In fact, we can say that if a reaction is exothermic, well, in that case, enthalpy is a driving force for that reaction. That actually helps us to know that that reaction will happen. So the exothermic uh, property of a reaction is a driving force. Now, like we said, there are some reactions that are endothermic. They actually absorb heat from the surroundings into the system. Now, what does that look like? Well, that means that you would start with the reactants at a lower enthalpy state, and then they would end up with products at a higher enthalpy state. Now, generally speaking in the universe, that's not how things work. Usually there's one way in which things will, will flow or, or move in the universe. Now, for example, if I take a rock and I set it right on the edge of a table, you know, it's not gonna take a lot for that rock to end up on the ground. So if I come back a couple of hours later and find the rock on the ground, I'm not gonna be very surprised because that's the way that the rock will tend to move from the table down to the ground. On the other hand, if I have the rock on the ground and then a couple hours later I come back and the rock has risen up to the level of the table, it's on the table, I know that the rock didn't get there by itself. Some other force, a person probably, had to pick it up and put it up there. And so that's kind of how that works. Well, it's kind of the same thing here for enthalpy. The natural flow of things is from a higher state of heat to a lower state of heat. So that's why exothermic reactions, are those don't surprise us. Those are normal. Those, that's the way the universe works. But in this direction here, going up in enthalpy, endothermic reactions, that's not the normal uh, direction that things go in the universe. There has to be some other force acting upon that. So when we say endothermic is not typical from a thermodynamic point of view, that just means that there's some other force acting on it that is making it happen or allowing it to happen. And we're going to be spending the rest of this video talking about what that force is that drives endothermic reactions. It is a force called entropy. Now, entropy sounds like the word enthalpy, you know, enthalpy, entropy, but they're very different. 
Enthalpy is, you know, heat, essentially, in chemistry, and it's represented by the letter H. Entropy is S. So that's S. And entropy is specifically defined as the quantity of possible energy states of the components of a system. Uh, that's the official definition of it. Now, it can be kind of confusing or hard to remember that sometimes. So we use this as a definition that helps us get through uh, most of what we can uh, talk about is in, in this course, at least AP Chemistry. It's the amount of chaos in something. It's the amount of disorder in something. And we can actually look at states of matter and very easily use that definition to say which one has more entropy. Here's an example of that. Let's say we have a solid. So perhaps this is, oh, I don't know, liquid, or not liquid, solid nitrogen. Perhaps it's all crystallized. Well, you can see that in this solid state, the molecules are in a very nice orderly arrangement, aren't they? They're in that nice, beautiful crystalline structure, that crystal arrangement. Every molecule is where it is supposed to be. There is very little chaos there, very little disorder. So we would say that the solid state has the least amount of entropy of the states of matter. Well, what if we have a liquid? Now we have this liquid nitrogen. Uh, the molecules are moving around. They're able to slip and slide past one another. Well, in the case of this liquid, it has more chaos, doesn't it? It has more entropy than the solid had in that uh, other diagram here on the left. Well, what if we have a gas? Now here, we have the nitrogen that has, or some other molecule, whatever that is, and they're able to float around. They're able to move independently of each other. There's a lot of potential chaos there, isn't there? Those molecules are all over the place. They're bumping into each other. They're bumping into the container walls. They're flying out, possibly even flying out of the container. So we say that the gas has the greatest amount of entropy of those three states of matter. So we can go in that direction. A solid has the least, a liquid has more entropy, and a gas has the greatest amount of chaos or greatest amount of entropy. Now, we talk about this in terms of things that we're familiar with. Let's say we have this uh, hotel here. This is a hotel that stood in Las Vegas for many years. And after uh, its use had been completed, well, they decided to implode it. They tore it down. And here's what it looked like afterwards. Now, which of these two states has the greater entropy, the greater amount of chaos? Well, I think you can see it's the one on the right. We have an increasing entropy here. And that makes sense because in the hotel, when it was standing, you had the rooms and they were ordered by number and it was all nice and orderly, organized. But in the, the rubble over here, there's not a whole lot of organization, is there? Everything is just you know blown up. It's all over the place. It's increased in entropy. Here's another example that you might be able to relate to. Here we have someone's house. Looks like a very nice house, a mansion of, of sorts. But let's say that we take this mansion and we decide to abandon it. We just let it, uh, let that revert to nature. And here's what it's going to look like after several years of being completely abandoned, just left alone to nature. Now, is that an increase in entropy? Is that more chaotic? Or is that a decrease in entropy? Less chaotic? Well, I think you can see that it is definitely an increase in entropy. It's gotten a whole lot more chaotic and ugly, I guess. The, you know, the trees and brush has grown up around it. Uh, looks like some, perhaps even the windows have been knocked out of it. So the increase in entropy is there. And that doesn't surprise us. You know, it's kind of like when you have an exothermic reaction, that doesn't surprise us. Increasing entropy, that's the way that the universe flows. You know, generally speaking, entropy will increase. So if you uh, have maybe your room or your home or your yard and you just leave it alone and abandon it, it's going to do something like this, isn't it? It's going to get more chaotic. The grass is not going to cut itself, you know. The, uh, the windows are not going to repair themselves. You know, if that does happen, if the windows suddenly get repaired and the grass is cut and looks nice, well, you know that some other force was acting on that, right? So uh, we have these other forces we're talking about. So 
generally speaking in the universe, entropy tends to increase when you're looking at spontaneous processes. And we'll talk more about that here a little bit later. So to summarize how we can classify entropy, if you have a gas, you know that's the highest entropy state of them all. And then if you have an aqueous solution, that's a little bit less because you have ions swimming around in a liquid. And then that's more chaotic than a pure liquid. You know, there, there are no ions swimming around in that, so it's less chaotic. And then a solid has the least entropy of them all. It's you know, the, the least chaotic that's got that nice crystalline structure, very orderly, less, less chaos there. And we can also say that systems at a higher temperature have a greater entropy than those at a lower temperature. Now, can you explain why that is? Well, hopefully, at this point in your chemistry uh, experience, you know that things at higher temperatures have molecules that are moving very, very fast, aren't they? So they're buzzing around all over the place. There's a lot of chaos there. But if you have a lower temperature, the molecules aren't moving as quickly, are they? So there's less chaos. So we can say higher temperature has a greater entropy than a lower temperature. Now, what if it's a tie? What if you have something that's got the same state of matter and it's at the same temperature? Well, to break the tie, it's systems that have more particles have greater entropy. You know, the more particles there are, the more opportunity for chaos you have, as opposed to having fewer particles. So it's like if we have a class that has uh, 30 students crammed into a classroom, or maybe 40 students, or imagine 50 students crammed into a classroom. You can have a lot of chaos there, can't you? A lot more than if you only had maybe 10 or, or 15 students in a class. Now, I know that's not always the case, but that's how it works in chemistry. So here's an example. Here we have uh, two diagrams that represent two gases at the same temperature. So notice it's a tie. They're both in the same state of matter. They're both at the same temperature. So which of them has the greater entropy? Explain your answer. Well, since it's a tie, we, we have to count molecules, don't we? So even without counting, I think we can all see that the one on the right has greater entropy simply for the fact that it has more molecules. And if we look at the answer, we can see that that certainly confirms what we just said. So the more particles there are, if everything else is the same, more particles get you greater entropy. So it's the one on the right. Let's do another series of examples. Let's predict the sign of delta S for each of the following reactions. So what that means is, is the entropy increasing, you know, positive delta S, or is entropy decreasing, negative delta S? So we'll start with this example. And here we have carbon dioxide solid that looks like it's turning into carbon dioxide gas. So a solid has very little entropy, a gas has a whole lot more entropy. So that sounds like a positive change, doesn't it? So we have a positive uh, delta S for that one. You know, it's increasing. How about this one? We have a case where we have two gas molecules that are combining to make one solid structure one solid formula unit. So what's that going to be? Well, a gas has a really high entropy, doesn't it? And then a solid has much less entropy. So that's a decrease, that's negative. What about this one? Let's say we have this net ionic equation. We've written this a couple times in AP Chemistry so far, haven't we? So here we have two aqueous ions. And Aqueous has quite a, bit of, quite a bit of entropy. It's only just under what a gas is. And then solid is the lowest of them all. So it's decreasing, isn't it? So we're decreasing entropy for this one. That's a negative sign. How about this one? Here we have a mix. We start out with one formula unit of a solid, and we end up with one solid and a gas as well. Well, we're increasing, aren't we? It's all solid all very structured, but then we go up to a solid and a gas. It's a mix, right? So we, we're increasing. That one's going to be positive as well. Let's do one more together. Let's take a look at this one, this, this one where we have two sulfur dioxide gas molecules, 
and an oxygen molecule to make two sulfur trioxide gas molecules. Well, uh, the states are the same on both sides, aren't they? We have gases on both sides, so it's a tie. So it comes down to the number of molecules we have. So let's count the particles. So on the left, we have you know, two there and one here. So that's three molecules on the left, on the reactant side, only two on the right side. So if we're going from three down to two, that's a drop in number of particles, so it's a drop in entropy as well. You know, fewer particles means less entropy. So I hope you've been able to understand what entropy is in uh, terms of AP chemistry, in terms of general chemistry. I hope you've enjoyed the video. hope you learned something about thermodynamics in this video. Thermodynamics is tough. And so if you've understood this, then you can give yourself a thumbs up. And if you like the video, well, then if you'll be so kind as to give me a thumbs up as well. Uh, that way, YouTube will uh, get the word out about these videos and help other students uh, learn AP chemistry as well. Thanks for joining me and hope to see you again on my channel where we can learn some more chemistry together.